This is episode nine of Discovering Classical Music, Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade. As always, we'll look at some historical context, then at the music itself, and then finally at some recommended recordings. So let's talk about the story behind Scheherazade and where it comes from. You may have heard of the collection of stories 1001 Nights, also known as Arabian Nights. It's a collection of Arabic, Middle Eastern tales from the Islamic Golden Age. Its origins are well over a thousand years old. This collection of stories has grown, evolved and expanded over many centuries as new tales are added to it from different parts of Asia and Africa. We still encounter many of these stories today. Though they weren't in the original collection, the Galand translation, which is an edition Rimsky-Korsakov might possibly have encountered, contains the stories of Aladdin and his lamp, Ali Baba and his forty thieves, and Sinbad the sailor. Baron Josef von Hammer Purgstall, writing on the Galand translation, says, Here we find the truest representation of the mind, the character, the civil life and domestic habits of a people once powerful enough to carry its civilization and its conquests into three of the great divisions of the globe. These tales exhibit to us in his own light the Arab under the tent in the desert and at the court of the caliph, in his commercial relations and amid the wandering caravan, in the usual intercourse of society and in the seclusion of the harem. This commentary might feel a little dated today, but it gives you an idea of what these texts meant to the Western world in the 1800s. An interesting feature of the A Thousand and One Nights is how they are all bound together by a kind of frame story. There is a central story which ties all the other tales together, and this story is based around the ruler, Sharia, and his wife, Scheherazade. The premise is basically, the king Sharia doesn't really trust women after having had an unfaithful wife, so each night he marries and sleeps with a new woman. Then, the following morning, he puts that new woman to death. This goes on for about three years, marrying women, sleeping with them, then immediately putting them to death. The land is running short of women. Many of the eligible ones have either died or fled. And so the buck passes to Scheherazade. But Scheherazade has a plan. On the night of their wedding, Scheherazade tells a story. The king likes her story and wants to hear more. And so instead of putting her to death, he lets her live. And so each night she tells him a new story, history or folk tale. And that's why the collection of stories is called 1001 Nights. And so that's how this collection of works A collection of rich Arabic tales is weaved together and told by Scheherazade, our point of continuity. Now, let's talk about Rimsky-Korsakov. Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov was fascinated with the sea. As a boy, his older brother was in the navy, and Nikolai would write letters for him. He read books on the sea and sailing, and yet, growing up in Tichvin in Russia, he had never actually seen the ocean. When Nikolai became of age, he went to study at the College of Naval Cadets, graduating in 1856. And so Nikolai got to have his oceanic adventures, travelling to far corners of the earth, including Eastern Asia, New York City and Rio de Janeiro. However, ultimately, the pull of music was stronger. When Nikolai wasn't at sea, he would take lessons from Balakirev, one of the great Russian pianists and composers. Then, when Nikolai was away at sea, he would work on his compositions using what Balakirev had taught him. It was later, in 1865, that meetings with Balakirev persuaded him to treat music and composition more seriously. Once Nikolai ceased to travel with the navy, he mostly stayed put in Russia for the rest of his life. All this taste of travel, adventuring off to the far corners of the earth, and then returning home to compose music, Could this glimpse of distant lands have been an influence in Scheherazade? There was another journey which Rimsky-Korsakov documents in his biography, My Musical Life. 
It was in July of 1874, Nikolai traveled to Crimea with his family, where the streets were filled with sound and music. He writes of the coffee houses, the shouts of its vendors, the chanting of the muezzins on the minarets, the services in the mosques, and the oriental music. It was while hearing the gypsy music of Bakshisarai that I first became acquainted with oriental music in its natural state and I believe I caught the main feature of its character. He writes that music filled the streets. In front of every coffee house, there was continual playing and singing. Later, when Nikolai returned to Bakchisaray, he was disappointed to discover that the streets had been cleared of music, and those seductive street sounds existed only in his memory. Anyway, Rimsky-Korsakov composed his Scheherazade suite in the summer of 1888, he prefaced his original score with some text connecting the music with the tales of Scheherazade in 1001 Nights. However, he wanted to avoid any literal programmatic readings of this music. The movements here do not represent actual tales from the collection. Instead, Nikolai writes, In the majority of cases, all these seeming leitmotifs are nothing but purely musical material, the themes from symphonic development. He did, however, in his original score, add titles to each of his movements. These titles don't refer to specific tales, but to general scenes. The first movement is titled The Sea and Sinbad's Ship. The second is The Calendar Prince. The third is The Young Prince and the Princess. The fourth is Festival at Baghdad. The sea, the ship breaks against a cliff surmounted by a bronze horseman. In later editions, Rimsky-Korsakov left these titles out, simply calling the movements 1, 2, 3, and 4. Even though Nikolai didn't want us to read too much story into the music, he did admit that the famous violin solo represents Scheherazade. He writes, The unifying thread in this suite consisted of the brief introductions to the first, second, and fourth movements, and the intermezzo in movement three, written for violin solo and delineating Scheherazade herself as she tells her wondrous tales to the stern sultan. Ultimately, Rimsky wanted this piece to be a kaleidoscope of fairy tale images and designs of oriental character. He writes, all I had desired was that the listener, if he likes my piece as symphonic music, should carry away the impression that it is beyond doubt an oriental narrative of some numerous and varied fairy tale wonders, and not merely four pieces played one after the other. Anyway, let's have a look at the music. But first, I wanted to mention a great music app that I've been using recently. It's called Encoder. That's N-K-O-D-A. It's an app which gives you immediate access to a huge bank of sheet music, tens of thousands of titles from publishers like Boozy and Hawks, Baron Writer, Novello, Chester and others. You can find a wealth of older music from Bach to Beethoven to Yes, Rimsky-Korsakov, but it also gives you access to some of the newest works in classical music. Hans Abrahamson, John Adams, Sariaho, Ludovico Einaudi, their scores are on this app, able to be accessed immediately. I don't know anything else that gives you access to such a rich and diverse library of sheet music right on your iPad, tablet or computer. It's a subscription app, and they are offering free trials, so you should definitely check it out. You can find it at www.encoder.com. That's N-K-O-D-A dot com. You could even use it to find a score of Scheherazade so that you can follow along with this podcast. Or if you play an instrument, it gives you access to all the orchestral parts to Scheherazade so you can play along. Anyway, Let's look at the music, and as always, I'll give you some pointers, but I'd highly encourage you to listen to the whole work yourself to get the full effect from this piece. It starts with this theme, which comes up everywhere. Let's call it the Sultan's theme. <laughs> I 
don't think the theme always represents the Sultan. It appears all over the place, in all kinds of different contexts, and Rimsky-Korsakov wouldn't want us to take it too literally as being the Sultan. But for the sake of this analysis, we'll call it the Sultan's theme. In this instance, we can definitely picture the Sultan, moody, reluctant, and imposing. It's followed by this beautiful chord sequence in the winds, E minor, D, C, F sharp, and A minor. So listen to the Sultan's theme again. On each downbeat, we get certain notes, first E, then D, then C, and then A sharp and F sharp, outlining an F sharp chord. E, D, C, and F sharp. Those are the big notes of that theme. And then we get the wind chords on E minor, D major, C major, and F sharp major. Pretty clever, eh? Then there's this violin solo, the theme for Scheherazade herself, about to weave her first tale. We could think of the violin as representing Scheherazade's voice, about to sing a song. The harp strummed accompaniment is like a guitar or a lute, accompanying the storytelling singer. And then we're into the main body of the movement, perhaps the first tale, the sea and Sinbad's ship. And from here, the movement takes on a kind of ABC, ABC structure. The A section is in E minor, and it has this kind of rocking wave figure over which the Sultan's theme is played. It's as if the Sultan has been inserted into this first story. We could imagine him on some ship over the rocking sea. So that idea develops and grows, and then we get this calmer idea, gentler seas, for the B section. And then, after a brief interlude, we get section C, where Scheherazade now weaves herself into the story. Notice it's Scheherazade's theme on the solo violin, but still with the rocking motion underneath it. This all builds to a big climax, with the Sultan's theme leading the way. And then we're back in the A section again, and the music takes us through those themes again, the A section, the B section, and the C section, with some differences. It all builds to a climax and then winds down very gently, using all the material which we've just heard. Go and listen to it, it's a great ride. The second movement is subtitled The Story of the Calendar Prince. It starts again with Scheherazade preparing to weave her story, this time with a bit more extravagance, where the violin solo has some double stops and embellishment. So the story starts with this famous bassoon solo. There are three parts to it. There's the beginning, the middle section, and then the end.
and all three parts recur in various ways throughout the movement. But for now, Rimsky-Korsakov is going to take that melody and give us a whole load of variations on it. So these variations will be our A section of the story. The movement is in a kind of ABA form. So so far we've heard the melody in bassoon with static low strings underneath it. Pretty simple. Now he's going to make the orchestra more opulent. The oboe takes the melody and we get some harp and winds. Then the music takes the melody and adds a little pace, like this. Then it's winds with heavy string pizzicato accompaniment and some timpani. Then a cello solo. Followed by the Sultan's theme in pizzicato bass, but notice the new idea in the winds. It's a kind of hasty theme, and this will come back a lot. So that, all those variations on the bassoon theme leading to here, was our first section in a kind of ABA form. Now there's an extended B section. It's a lot more fast paced, almost chaotic, and there's all kinds of variation. It starts like this. <laughs> And then there's this new idea, which will be used a lot for the rest of the whole piece. And from here, the music goes rather mad for a while, on a fanciful whirlwind tour of creative ideas, a real musical adventure. But finally, after this adventure, it returns to the A section material, using that bassoon melody again, this time in strings with a tense harmonic accompaniment. And there's a series of great variations on it. And in a very creative way, the movement comes crashing to an end. The third movement is subtitled The Young Prince and the Young Princess. This is the only movement that doesn't start with Scheherazade weaving her story. Instead, we go straight into the story. Perhaps this is intentional. We're blurring the lines. What is story and what is real? Perhaps the young prince and the princess are supposed to be Scheherazade and the Sultan in love. Is this one of her stories? Or is she making this her reality? So, anyway, this movement is pretty easy to follow. It's in a kind of ABAB form. The A section is a love theme, and the B section is a more playful scherzando music. Here's a bit of the love music. And there's this gorgeous clarinet interlude. And when the B section comes, it's all cute and playful with little snare drums and a sweet new theme.
And there are playful moments, moments with lots of percussion. Moments of Russian exoticism. But we come back to our A section, our love theme on high strings. Only this time, finally, Scheherazade's theme appears. We haven't seen her yet this movement, remember? But now, here she is. It's kind of like being jolted awake from a story, being brought back into reality from the fantasy that we were enjoying. But she starts playing these ricochet figures, and the story re-emerges, only with Scheherazade's voice now being a part of it. Again, the lines are being blurred. What is story and what is reality? And she joins in, singing the love song. Followed by an emotional outburst of the orchestra. And then finally, we return to a kind of variant of our B section, except that now, instead of small and cute, it's passionate, it's in love, it's more animated. And it builds in excitement before finally settling down with this coda theme. which closes the movement, except for one more quick goodnight kiss. <laughs> movement four is labelled Festival at Baghdad, the sea, the shipwreck against a rock surmounted by a bronze warrior. So first we get a little introduction, our furious Sultan's theme. Sounds like the Sultan is angry. <laughs> And then Scheherazade's theme, over a strange dominant pedal, making it sound unresolved, more anxious, worried, concerned. And the double-stopped figures the violin has to play are particularly difficult, making it sound even more anxious. She'd better come up with a story, and fast. She's interrupted by the Sultan's theme again. He is not in a good mood. Now we have a tonic pedal, but on extremely low strings, again suggesting a scene of more gravitas or starkness. Moreover, Scheherazade's theme is marked con forza, with force and with many accents, and often triple or even quadruple stops, which is again extremely difficult to do on a violin. So there's something much more agitated or concerned about her theme there. Can she come up with something in time? But then, as if from nowhere, a story emerges. The scene is set in a festival at Baghdad. Here is the introductory rhythm. And the festival theme in flute.
and this develops in pace and frantic excitement. And, well, if you can't come up with anything totally new to appease your angry husband, then perhaps you can borrow from something old. Out of nowhere, suddenly our prince appears from the second movement. And we hear a whole bunch of material from the second movement. And then, if that wasn't enough, we hear music from the third movement too. It's as if all our favourite characters from previous episodes are appearing. And so all this material welds together in the spirit of the festival. It really is a most thrilling, almost exhausting festival, and it leads somewhere frenetic. And then to an awesome build-up and climax. Suddenly, we're back with the music from the first movement. We're in the sea again, but now it's huge, waves crashing everywhere. And it reaches a climax. And it settles on this intense moment with an idea from the second movement, building in harmonic tension until... We can presume from Rimsky-Korsakov's title that that is the ship crashing into a rock. So this is her most climactic and exciting story yet. It's like a series finale. All our favourite characters and set pieces have made appearances, ending with a climactic shipwreck. And then the Sultan's motive returns, almost sad. But we return to this magical motive from the first movement again, to end the story. And to wrap it all up, Scheherazade comes, now herself becalmed. She has succeeded in calming the Sultan, and helped him to resolve to stop killing women. <laughs> Her theme has now returned to the calm state of the start. With some harmonics to embellish it. And we get this music on the Sultan's motif to wind down the evening. It's accompanied by the same chords we heard in the winds from the very beginning of the piece. E minor, D major, C major, F sharp, A minor, all with Scheherazade's gorgeous harmonics over the top. it's suggesting that the Sultan has finally been tamed, has finally found inner peace at last. Then, finally, those wind chords from the very beginning return, with Scheherazade's E unifying them. And one last statement from Scheherazade, lower in her range. (laughs) 
and it's a happy, safe ending in E major. So for recordings, my favourite recording, or the one I always return to, is the one conducted by Valery Gergiev, conducting the Kirov Orchestra. It's just so epic and massive, and he gets an absolutely stellar, thrilling performance from the orchestra. I actually have a whole playlist of recordings from a few years ago when I got to conduct this work. Another one I loved was Kirill Kondrashin with the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra. Kondrashin is another Russian master. He has some great Tchaikovsky recordings, which I love, of his symphonies. And this Scheherazade is a little less huge. It's more terse, but it is thrilling and it has a great different sound if you want to try something different from Gergiev's hugeness. Another one I found in my playlist is Leopold Stokowski with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Why am I recommending Stokowski? Because of the luxuriant sounds and sound experiments he seems to get out of the orchestra. It's something that's way out of fashion today, but his music making is clearly impassioned and it makes for a great listen, especially if you're already familiar with Scheherazade. So thank you so much for listening. If you want to help support this channel or buy me a coffee to say thank you, then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash inside the score. I often have suggestion boxes or question and answer suggestions. And if I like one of your suggestions, then I may well cover it in a future video or podcast. So do check that out. Again, thank you for listening and hopefully I'll see you very soon.